Part 2 of Chapter 6 of The Abandoned Room This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The Abandoned Room by Wadsworth Camp The One Who Stepped in the Private Staircase Chapter 6, Section 2 When they were in the house, their halting curiosity was lost in a vast surprise. The hall was empty, but they heard voices in the library. They hurried across the dining room, pausing in the doorway, staring with unbelieving eyes at the accustomed picture they had least expected to see. Paredes lounged on the divan, smoking with easy indifference. His clothing and his shoes were spotless. He had shaved, and his beard had been freshly trimmed. Rawlins and the district attorney stood in front of the fireplace, studying him with perplexed eyes. The persistence of their regard, even after Bobby's entrance, suggested to him that the evidence remained secreted that the officers, under the circumstances, were scarcely interested in his return. He was swept himself into a, an explosive amazement. Carlos, what the deuce are you doing here? The Panamanian expelled a, a cloud of smoke. He smiled, resting after a fatiguing walk. In his unexpected presence, Bobby fancied a demolition of the hope Graham and he had brought back from the city. He couldn't imagine guilt lurking behind that serene manner. Where did you come from? What were you up to last night? There was no accounting for Peretti's daring, he told himself, no accounting for his easy gesture now as he drew again at his cigarette and tossed it in the fireplace. These gentlemen, he said, have been asking just that question. I'm honored. I had no idea my movements were of such interest. I've told him that I took a stroll. The night was over, there was no point in going to bed, and all day I had been without exercise. Yet, Graham said harshly, you've had practically no sleep since you came here. Paredes nodded. Very distressing, isn't it? Maybe, Rawlins sneered. You'll tell us why you went on tiptoe, and I suppose you didn't hear a woman crying in the woods. That's just it, Paredes answered. I did hear something like that, and it occurred to me to follow such a curious sound. So I went on tiptoe, as you call it. Why? Robinson exclaimed angrily. You walked in the lake to hide your tracks. Paredes smiled. It was very dark. That was chance. Quite silly of me. My feet got wet. I gather, Rawlins said. It was chance that took you to the deserted house. Peretti shook his head. Don't you think I was as much puzzled as the rest of that strange disappearing light? It was as good a place to walk as any. Where have you been since? Graham asked. When I had got there, I was tired, Peretti answered. Since it wasn't far to the station, I thought I'd go on into Smithtown and have a bath and rest. But I assure you I've trudged back from the station just now. Suddenly he repeated the apparently absurd formula he had used with Howells. You know the court seems full of unfriendly things. What the ignorant would call ghosts. I'm Spanish and I know. After a moment he added, the woods, too. I shouldn't care to wander through them too much after dark. Robinson stared, but Rawlins brushed the question aside. What hotel did you go to in Smithtown? It's called the New. Nothing could be farther from the fact. Shall I see if that's straight, sir? The district attorney agreed, and Rawlins left the room. Paredes laughed. How interesting. I'm under suspicion. It would be something, wouldn't it, to commit crimes with the devilish ingenuity of these? No, no, Mr. District Attorney, look to the ghosts. They alone are sufficiently clever, 
but I might say, since you take this attitude, that I don't care to answer any more questions until you discover something that might give you the, the right to ask them. He laid back on the divan, languidly lighting another cigarette. Graham beckoned Robinson. Bobby followed them out, suspecting Graham's purpose, unwilling that action should be taken too hastily against the Panamanian, for even now guilty knowledge seemed incompatible with Peretti's polished reserve. When he joined the others, indeed Graham, with an aggressive air, was demanding the district attorney's intentions. If he could elude you so easily last night, it's common sense to put him where you can find him in case of need. He's given you excuse enough. The man's got me guessing, Robinson mused, but there are other elements. What's happened since we left? Graham asked quickly. Have you got any trace of Howell's evidence? Robinson smiled enigmatically, but his failure was apparent. I'm like Howells, he said. I'd risk nearly anything myself to learn how the room was entered, how the crimes were committed, how those poor devils were made to alter their positions. So, Bobby said, you had my rooms in New York searched. You had me followed today. It's ridiculous. Robinson ignored him. He stepped to the front door, opened it, and looked around the court. What did the Sphinx mean about ghosts in the court? They walked out, gazing helplessly at the trampled glass, about the fountain, at the melancholy walls, at the partly opened window of the room of mystery. He knows something, Robinson mused. Maybe you're right, Mr. Graham, but I wonder if I oughtn't to go farther and take you all. Graham smiled uncomfortably, but Bobby knew why the official failed to follow that radical course. Like Howells, he hesitated to remove from the Cedars the person most likely to solve its mystery. As long as a chance remained that Howells had been right about Bobby, he would give Silas Blackburn's grandson his head, merely making sure, as he had done this morning, that there should be no escape. He glanced up. I wonder if our foreigner's laughing at me now. Graham made a movement toward the door. We might, he said significantly, find that out without disturbing him. Robinson nodded and led the way silently back to the house. Such a method was repugnant to Bobby, and he followed at a distance. Then he saw from the movements of the two men ahead that the library had again offered the unexpected, and he entered. Paredes was no longer in the room. Bobby was about to speak, but Robinson shook his head angrily, raising his hand in a gesture of warning. All three strained forward, listening, and Bobby caught the sound that had arrested the others, a stealthy scraping that would have been inaudible except through such a brooding silence as pervaded the old house. Bobby's interest quickened at this confirmation of Graham's theory. There was a projection of cold fear, moreover, in its sly allusion. It gave to his memory of Paredes, with his tall, graceful figure, his lack of emotion, his inscrutable eyes and his pointed beard, a suggestion nearly satanic. For the stealthy scraping had come from behind the closed door of the private staircase. Howells had gone up that staircase. None of them could forget for a moment that it led to the private hall outside the room in which the murders had been committed. It occurred to Bobby that the triumph Graham's face expressed was out of keeping with the man. It disturbed him nearly as thoroughly as Paredes' stealthy presence in that place. We've got him, Graham whispered. Robertson's bulky figure moved cautiously toward the door. He grasped the knob, swung the door open, and stepped back, smiling his satisfaction. Halfway down the staircase, Paredes leaned against the wall, one foot raised and outstretched, as though an infinitely quiet descent had been interrupted. The exposure had been too quick for his habit. 
His face failed to hide its discomfiture. His laugh rang false. Hello! I'm afraid we've caught you, Paredes, Graham said, and the triumph blazed now in his voice. What Paredes did then was more startling, more out of key than any of his recent actions. He came precipitately down. His eyes were dangerous. As Bobby watched the face whose quiet had at last been tempestuously destroyed, he felt that the man was capable of anything under sufficient provocation. "'Got me for what?' he snarled. "'Tell us why you were sneaking up there in connection with your little excursion before dawn. It suggests a guilty knowledge.' Peretti straightened. He shrugged his shoulders. With an admirable effort of will, he smoothed the rage from his face. But for Bobby, the satanic suggestion lingered. "'Why do you suppose I'm here?' he said in a restrained voice that scarcely rose above a whisper. "'To help Bobby. I was simply looking around for Bobby's sake.' That angered Bobby. He wanted to cry out against the supposed friend who had at last shown his teeth. That. Graham laughed, is why you sneaked, why you didn't make any noise, why you lost your temper when we caught you at it. What about it, Mr. District Attorney? Robinson stepped forward. Nothing else to do, Mr. Graham. He's too slippery. I'll put him in a safe place. You mean, Paredes cried, that you'll arrest me? You've guessed it. I'll lock you up as a material witness. Paredes swung on Bobby. You'll permit this, Bobby? You'll forget that I'm a guest in your house? Bobby flushed. Why have you stayed? What were you doing up there? Answer those questions. Tell me what you want. Paredes turned away. He took a cigarette from his pocket and lighted it. His fingers were not steady. For the first time it became evident to Bobby, Paredes was afraid. Rawlins came back from the telephone. He took in the tableau. What's the rumpus? Run this man to Smithtown, Robinson directed. Lock him up and tell the judge, when he's arraigned in the morning, that I want him held as a material witness. He was at the hotel in Smithtown all right, Rawlins said. He tapped Peretti's arm. You coming on this little joy ride like a lamb or a lion? Say, you'll find the jail about as comfortable as the new hotel. Peretti smiled. The evil and dangerous light died in his eyes. He became all at once easy and impervious again. Like a lamb, how else? I'm sorry, Carlos, Bobby muttered. If you'd only say something, if you'd only explain your movements, if you'd only really help. Again, Paredes shrugged his shoulders. Handcuffs, he asked Rollins. Rollins ran his hands deftly over the Panamanian's clothing. No armed neutrality for me, he grinned. All right, we'll forget the bracelets since you haven't a gun. Puffing at his cigarette, Paredes got his coat and hat and followed the detective from the house. Robinson and Graham climbed the private staircase to commence another systematic search of the hall. To discover, if they could, the motive for Peretti's stealthy presence there. Bobby accepted greedily this opportunity to find Catherine, to learn from her, undisturbed, what had happened in the house that morning. The meaning, perhaps, of her despairing gesture when, in response to his knock, she opened her door and stepped into the corridor, he guessed her despair had been an expression of the increased strain of her helplessness in face of Robinson's harsh determination. He questioned me for an hour, she said, principally about the heel mark in the court. They cling to that because I don't think they found anything new at the lake. You don't know anything about it, do you, Catherine? You weren't there. You didn't do that for me. I wasn't there, Bobby. I honestly don't know any more about it than you do. Carlos was in the court, he mused. Did you know they'd taken him? 
we found him creeping down the private stairway. There was a hard quality about her gratitude. I am glad, Bobby. The man makes me shudder, and all morning they seemed more interested in you than in him. They've rummaged every room, even mine, she laughed feverishly. That's why I've been so upset. They seemed, she broke off. She picked at her handkerchief. After a moment, she looked him frankly in the eyes and continued. They seemed almost as doubtful of me as of you. He recalled Paredes' suspicion of the girl. It's nonsense, Catherine, and I'm to blame for that, too. She put her fingers to her lips. Her smile was wistful. Hush, you mustn't blame yourself. You mustn't think of that. Again her solicitude, their isolation in the darkened place, tempted him, aroused impulses nearly irresistible. Her slender figure, the pretty face, grown familiar and more desirable through all these years, swept him to a harsher revolt than he had conquered in the library. In the face of Graham, in spite of his own intolerable position, he knew he couldn't fight that truth eternally. She must have noticed his struggle without grasping its cause, for she touched his hand and the wistfulness of her expression increased. I wish you wouldn't think of me, Bobby. It's you we must all think of. He accepted with a cold dismay the sisterly anxiety of her attitude. It made his renunciation easier. He walked away. Why do you go? She called after him. He gestured vaguely without turning. He didn't see her again until dinner time. She was as silent then as she had been the night before when Howells had sat with them, his moroseness veiling a sharp interest in the plan that was to lead to his death. Robinson's mood was very different. He talked a great deal, making no effort to hide his irritation. His failure to find any clue in the private staircase after Paredes's arrest had clearly stimulated his interest in Bobby. The sharp little eyes, surrounded by puffy flesh, held a threat for him. Bobby was glad when the meal ended. Howell's body was taken away that night. It was a relief for all of them to know that the old room was empty again. I dare say you won't sleep there, Graham said to Robinson. Robinson glanced at Bobby. Not as things stand, he answered. The library lounge is plenty good enough for me tonight. Graham went upstairs with Bobby. There was no question about his purpose. He wouldn't repeat last night's mistake. At least, he said, when the door was closed behind them, I can see if you do get up and wander about in your sleep. I'd bet a good deal that you won't. If I did, it would be an indication. Granted, it's your custom. What is there to tempt you tonight? Bobby answered, half jesting. You've not forgotten Robinson on the library sofa. The man isn't exactly working for me. Tonight he seems almost as unfriendly as Howells was. He yawned. I ought to sleep now, if ever. I've seldom been so tired. Two such nights... He hesitated. But I'm glad you're here, Hartley. I can go to sleep with a more comfortable feeling. Don't worry, Graham said. You'll sleep quietly enough, and we'll all be better for a good rest. For only a little while they talked of the mystery, while Graham regretted his failure to find any trace of Maria. Their voices dwindled sleepily. Bobby recalled his last thought before losing himself last night. He tried to force from his mind now the threat in Robinson's eyes. He told himself again and again that the man wasn't actually unfriendly. Then the blackness encircled him. He slept. Almost at once it seemed to him he was fighting away, demanding drowsily, "'What's the matter? Leave me alone.' He heard Graham's voice, unnaturally subdued and anxious. "'What are you doing, Bobby?' Then Bobby knew he was no longer in his bed, that he stood instead in a cold place, and the meaning of his position came with a rush of sick terror. Get hold of yourself, Graham said. Come back. 
Bobby opened his eyes. He was in the upper hall at the head of the stairs. Unconsciously, he had been about to creep quietly down, perhaps to the library. Graham had awakened him. It seemed to offer the answer to everything. It seemed to give outline to a monstrous familiar that drowned his real self in the black pit while it conducted his body to the commission of unspeakable crimes. He lurched into the bedroom and sat shivering on the bed. Graham entered and quietly closed the door. "'What time is it?' Bobby asked hoarsely. "'Half past two. I don't think Robinson was aroused.' The damp moon gave an ominous unreality to the room. "'What did I do?' Bobby whispered. "'Got softly out of bed and went to the hall. "'It was uncanny. You were like an automaton. "'I didn't wake you at once. You see, I... "'I thought you might go to the old room.' Bobby shook again. He drew a blanket about his shoulders. "'And you believed I'd show the way in and out?' but the room was empty, so I was going downstairs. He shuddered. Good God, then it's all true. I did it for the money. I put Howells out to protect myself. I was going after Robinson. It's true, Hartley. Tell me, do you think it's true? Graham turned away. Don't ask me to say anything to help you just now, he answered huskily. For after this, I don't dare, Bobby. I don't dare. End of chapter 6, section 2. Seven of The Abandoned Room. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Bowie The Abandoned Room by Wadsworth Camp Chapter 7 The Amazing Meeting in the Shadows of the Old Courtyard Bobby returned to his bed. He lay there still shivering beneath the heavy blankets. I don't dare, he echoed Graham's words. There's nothing else anyone can say. I must decide what to do. I must think it over. But, as always, thought brought no release. It merely insisted that the case against him was proved. At last he had been seen slipping unconsciously from his room, and at the same hour. All that remained was to learn how he had accomplished the apparent miracles. Then no excuse would remain for not going to Robinson and confessing. The woman at the lake and in the courtyard, the movement of the body and the vanishing of the evidence under his hand, Paradis's odd behavior, all became a disbind, puzzling details that failed to obscure the chief fact. After this something must be done about Paradis's detention. He hadn't dreamed that his weariness could placate even momentarily such reflections, but at last he slept again. He was aroused by the tramping of men around the house and strange, harsh voices. He raised himself on his elbow and glanced from the window. It had long been daylight. Two burly fellows in overalls, carrying pick and spade across their shoulders, pushed through the underbrush at the edge of the clearing. He turned. Graham, fully dressed, stood at the side of the bed. Those men? Bobby asked wearily. The grave diggers, Graham answered. They are going to work in the old cemetery to prepare a place for Silas Blackburn and with his fathers. That's why I have come to wake you up. The minister has telephoned Catherine. He will be here before noon. Do you know it's after ten o'clock? For some time Bobby stared through the window at the desolate, ragged landscape. It was abnormally cold, even for the late fall. Dull clouds obscured the sun and furnished an illusion of crowding earthward. A funeral day. The words slipped into his mind. He repeated them. When your grandfather's buried, Graham answered softly, we'll all feel happier. Why? Bobby asked. It won't lessen the fact of his murder. Time, Graham said, lessens such facts, even for the police. Bobby glanced at him, flushing. You mean you've decided to stand by me after what happened last night? Graham smiled. I've thought it over. I slept like a top last night. I heard nothing. I saw nothing. Ought I to want you to stand by me? Bobby said. Oughtn't I make it a clean breast of it? At least I must do something about parodies. Graham frowned. It's hard to believe he had any connection with your sleepwalking last night. 
Yet it's as clear as ever that Maria and he are up to some game in which you figure. He shouldn't be in jail, Bobby persisted. Get up, Graham advised. Bathe and have some breakfast. Then we can decide. There's no use talking of the other thing. I've forgotten it. As far as possible, you must. Bobby sprang upright. How can I forget it? If it was hard to face sleep before, what do you think it is now? Have I any right? Don't, Graham said. I'll be with you again tonight. If I were satisfied beyond the shadow of a doubt, I'd advise you to confess. But I can't be until I know what Maria and Paradis are doing. When Bobby had bathed and dressed, he found, in spite of his mental turmoil, that his sleep had done him good. While he breakfasted, Graham urged him to eat, tried to drive from his brain the morbid aftermath of last night's revealing moment. The manager took my advice, but Maria's still missing. Her pictures are in most of the papers. There have been reporters here this morning about the murders. He strolled over and handed Bobby a number of newspapers. "'Where's Robinson?' Bobby asked. "'I saw him in the court a while ago. I dare say he's wandering around, perhaps watching the men at the grave.' "'He learned nothing new last night? I was with him at breakfast. I gather not.' Bobby looked up. "'Isn't that an automobile coming through the woods?' he asked. "'Maybe Rollins back from Smithtown, or the minister.' The car stopped at the entrance of the court. They heard the remote tinkling of the front doorbell. Jenkins passed through. The cold air invading the hall and the dining room told them he had opened the door. His sharp exclamation recalled Howell's report, which, at their direction, he had failed to mail. Had his exclamation been drawn by an accuser? Bobby started to rise. Graham moved toward the door. Then Jenkins entered and stood to one side. Bobby shared his astonishment, for Paradis walked in, unbuttoning his overcoat, the former easy-mannered, uncommunicative foreigner. He appeared, moreover, to have slept pleasantly. His eyes showed no weariness, his clothing no disarrangement. He spoke at once, quite as if nothing had disagreeable had shattered his departure. "'Good morning. If I had dreamed of this change in the weather, I would have brought a heavier overcoat. I've nearly frozen driving from Smithtown.' Before either man could grope for a suitable greeting, he faced Bobby. He felt in his pockets with whimsical discouragement. "'Fact is, Bobby, I left New York too suddenly.' I hadn't noticed until a little while ago. You see, I spent a good deal in Smithtown yesterday. Bobby spoke with unobvious confusion. What do you mean, Carlos? I thought you were... Grand interrupted with a flat demand for an exclamation. How did you get away? Paradis waved his hand. Later, Mr. Graham. There is a hack driver outside who is even more suspicious than you. He wants to be paid. I asked Rollins to drive me back, but he rushed from the courthouse, probably to telephone his rotund superior. Fact is, this fellow wants five dollars. I don't write his rate. I've told him so. But it doesn't do any good. So will you lend me, Bobby? Bobby handed him a bank note. He didn't grimace Graham's meaning glance. Paradis gave the money to the butler. Pay him, will you, Jenkins? Thanks. He surveyed the remains of Bobby's breakfast and sat down. May I? My breakfast was early, and prison food, when you're not in the habit. Bobby tried to account for Paradis' friendly manner. That he should have come back at all was sufficiently strange, but it was harder to understand why he should express no resentment for his treatment yesterday, why he should fail to refer to Bobby's questions at the moment of his arrest, or to the openly expressed enmity of Graham. Only one theory promised to fit at all. It was necessary for the Panamanian to return to the Cedars. His purpose, whatever it was, compelled him to remain for the present in the mournful, tragic house. Therefore, he would crush his justifiable anger he would make it practically impossible for Bobby to refuse his hospitality. And he had asked for money, only a trifling sum. Yet Graham would grasp at the fact to support his earlier suspicion. Paradis' arrival possessed one virtue. It diverted Bobby's thoughts temporarily from his own dilemma, from his inability to chart a course. Graham, on the other hand, was ill at ease. Beyond a doubt, he was disarmed by Paradis' good humor. For him, yesterday's incident was not so lightly to be passed over, Eventually, his curiosity conquered. The words came, nevertheless, with some difficulty. We scarcely expected you back. His laugh was short and embarrassed. We took it for granted you would find it necessary to stay in Smithtown for a while. Paradis sipped the coffee which Jenkins had poured. Splendid coffee! You should have tasted what I had this morning. Simple enough, Mr. Graham. I telephoned as soon as Rollins got me to the Bastille. I communicated with the lawyer who represents the company for which I once worked. He's a prominent and brilliant man. He planned it with some local fellow. When I was arraigned at the opening of court this morning, the judge could hold me only as a material witness. He fixed a pretty stiff bail, but the local lawyer was there with a bondsman, and I came back. My clothes are here. 
You don't mind, Bobby. That moment in the hall when Graham had awakened him urged Bobby to reply with a genuine warmth. I don't mind. I'm glad you're out of it. I'm sorry you went as you did. I was tired, at my wit's end. Your presence in the private staircase was the last straw. You will forgive us, Carlos. Herodes smiled. He put down his coffee cup and lighted the cigarette. He smoked with a vast contentment. That's better. Nothing to forgive, Bobby. Let us call it a misunderstanding. Graham moved closer. Perhaps you'll tell us now what you are doing in the private staircase. Herodes blew a wreath of smoke. His eyes still smiled, but his voice was harder. Bygones are bygones. Isn't that so, Bobby? Since you wish it, Bobby said. But more important than the knowledge Graham desired loomed the old question. What was the man's game? What held him here? Robinson entered. The flush around his eyes was puffier than it had been yesterday. Worry had increased the incongruous discontent of his round face. Clearly he had slept little. I saw you arrive, he said. Rollins warned me. But I must say I didn't think you'd use your freedom to come to us. Paradis laughed. Since the law won't hold me at your convenience in Smithtown, I keep myself at your service here, if Bobby permits it. Could you ask more? Bobby shrank from the man with whom he had idled away so much time and money. That fleeting, satanic impression of yesterday came back, sharper and more alarming. Paradis' clear challenge to the district attorney was the measure of his strength. His mind was subtler than theirs. His reserve and easy daring mastered them all, and always, as now, he laughed at the futility of their efforts to sound his purposes, to limit his freedom of action. Bobby didn't care to meet the uncommunicative eyes whose depths he had never been able to explore. Was there a special power there that could control the destinies of other people, that might make men walk unconsciously to accomplish the ends of an unscrupulous brain? The district attorney appeared as much at sea as the others. Thanks, he said dryly to Paradis. And glancing at Bobby, he asked with a hollow scorn, You've no objection to the gentleman visiting you for the present? If he wishes, Bobby answered, a trifle amused at Robinson's obvious fancy of a collusion between Paradis and himself. Robinson jerked his head toward the window. I've been watching the preparations out there. I guess when he's laid away you'll be thinking about having the will read. No hurry, Bobby answered with a quick intake of breath. I suppose not, Robinson sneered since everybody knows well enough what's in it. Bobby arose. Robinson still sneered. You'll be at the grave, as chief mourner? Bobby walked from the room. He hadn't cared to reply. He feared, as it was, that he had let slip his increased self-doubt. He put on his coat and hat and left the house. The raw cold, the year's first omen of winter, made his blood run quicker. Forced into his mind a cleansing simulation. But almost immediately even that prophylactic was denied him. With his direction a matter of indifference, chance led him into the thicket at the side of the house. He had walked some distance. The underbrush had long interposed a veil between him and the cedars above, whose roofs smoke wreathed in the still air like fantastic figures weaving a shroud to lower over the time-stained, melancholy walls. For once he was grateful to the forest because it had forbidden him to glance perpetually back at that dismal and pensive picture. Then he became aware of twigs hastily lopped off of bushes bent and torn, of the uncovering, through these careless means of an old path. Simultaneously there reached his ears the scraping of metal implements in the soft soil, the dull thud of earth falling regularly. He paused, listening. The labor of the men was given an uncouth rhythm by their grunting expulsions of breath. Otherwise the nature of their industry and its surroundings had imposed upon them a silence, in itself beast-like and unnatural. At last a harsh voice came to Bobby. Its brevity pointed the previous dumbness of the speaker. Deep enough! And Bobby turned and hurried back along the roughly restored path, as if fleeing from an immaterial thing suddenly quickened with the power of accusation. He could picture the fresh oblong excavation in the soil of the family burial ground. He could see where the men had had to tear bushes from among the graves in order to insert their tools. There was an ironical justice in the condition of the old cemetery. He had received no internment since the death of Catherine's father. Like everything about the Cedars, Silas Blackburn had delivered it to the swift obliterating fingers of time. If the old man in his selfishness had paused to gaze beyond the inevitable fact of death, Bobby reflected, he would have guarded with a more precious interest in the drapings of his final sleep. This necessary task on which Bobby had stumbled had made the thicket less congenial than the house. 
As he walked back, he forecasted with a keen apprehension his approaching ordeal. It would, doubtless, be more difficult to endure than Howell's experiment over Silas Blackburn's body in the old room. Could he witness the definite imprisonment of his grandfather in a narrow box? Could he watch the covering earth fall noisily in that bleak place of silence without displaying for Robinson the guilt that impressed him more and more? A strange man appeared, walking from the direction of the house. His black clothing, relieved only by narrow edges of white cuffs between the sleeves and the heavy morning gloves, fitted with solemn harmony into the landscape and Bobby's mood. Such a figure was appropriate to the cedars. Bobby stepped to one side, placing a screen of dead foliage between himself and the man whose profession it was to mourn. He emerged from the forest and saw again the leisurely weaving of the smoke shroud above the house. Then his eyes were drawn by the restless movements of a pair of horses, standing in the shafts of a black wagon at the court entrance, and his ordeal became like a vast morass in which offers no likely path, yet whose crossing is the price of salvation. He was glad to see Graham leave the court and hurry toward him. I was coming to hunt you out, Bobby. The ministers arrived. So has Dr. Groom. Everything's about ready. Dr. Groom? Yes, he used to see a good deal of your grandfather. It's natural enough he should be here. Bobby agreed indifferently. They walked slowly back to the house. Graham made it plain that his mind was far from the sad business ahead. What do you think of Paradis coming back as if nothing were wrong? he asked. He ignores what happened yesterday. He settles himself in the cedars again. I don't know what to think of it, Bobby answered. This morning Carlos gave me the creeps. Graham glanced at him curiously. He spoke with pronounced deliberation, startling Bobby for this friend expressed practically the thought that Parody's arrival had driven into his own mind. Gave me the creeps, too. Makes me sure than ever that he has abnormally deep purpose in using his wits to hang on here. He suggests resources as hard to understand as anything that has happened in the old room. You'll confess, Bobby, he's had a good deal of influence over you. An influence for evil? I'd like to go around with him, if that's what you mean. Isn't he the cause of the last two or three months' nonsense in New York? I won't blame Carlos for that. Bobby muttered. He influenced you against your better judgment, Graham persisted, to refuse to leave with me the night of your grandfather's death. Maria did her share, Bobby said. He broke off, looking at Graham. What are you driving at? I've been asking myself since he came back, Graham answered, if there's any queer power behind his quiet manner. Maybe he is psychic. Maybe he can do things we don't understand. I've wondered if he had, without your knowing it required sufficient influence to direct your body when your mind no longer controlled it. It's a nasty thought, but I've heard of such things. You mean Carlos may have made me go to the hall last night, perhaps sent me to the old room those other times? Now that another had expressed the idea, Bobby fought it with all his might. No, I won't believe it. I've been weak, Hartley, but not that weak. And I tell you, I did feel Howell's body move under my hand. Don't misunderstand me, Graham said gently. I must consider every possibility. You were excited and imaginative when you went to the old room to take the evidence. It was a shock to have your candle go out. Your own hand, reaching out to Howells, might have moved spasmodically. I mean, you may have been responsible for the thing without realizing it. In the disappearance of the evidence, Bobby defended himself. If it had been stolen earlier, the coat pocket might have retained its bulging safe. We know now that Paradis is capable of sneaking around the house. No, no, Bobby said hotly. You're trying to take away my one hope. But I was there and you weren't. I know with my own senses what happened, and you don't. Paradis has no such influence over me. I won't think of it. If it's so far-fetched, Graham asked quietly, why do you revolt from the idea? Bobby turned on him. And why do you fill my mind with such thoughts? If you think I'm guilty, say so. Go tell Robinson so. He glanced away while the angry color left his face. He was a little dazed by the realization that he had spoken to Graham as he might have done to an enemy as he had spoken to Howells in the old bedroom. He felt the touch of Graham's hand on his shoulder. I'm only working in your service, Graham said kindly. I'm sorry if I've troubled you by seeking physical facts in order to escape the ghosts. For Groom has brought the ghosts back with him. Don't make any mistake about that. You want the truth, don't you? Yes, Bobby said, even if it does for me. But I want it quickly. I can't go on this way, indefinitely. Yet that flash of temper had given him courage to face the ordeal. A lingering resentment at Graham's suggestion lessened the difficulty of his position. Entering the court, he scarcely glanced at the black wagon. There were more dark-clothed men in the hall. Rollins had returned. 
from the rug in front of the fireplace, he surveyed the group with a bland curiosity. Robinson sat nearby, glowering at Paradis. The Panamanian had changed his clothing. He, too, was somberly dressed, and instead of the vivid necktie he had worn from the courthouse, a jet-black scarf was perfectly arranged beneath his collar. He lounged opposite the district attorney, his eyes studying the fire, his fingers on the chair arm were restless. Dr. Groom stood at the foot of the stairs, talking with the clergyman, a stout and unctuous figure. Bobby noticed that the great stolid form of the doctor was ill at ease. From his thickly bearded face his reddish eyes gleamed forth with a fresh instability. The clergyman shook hands with Bobby. We need not delay. Your cousin is upstairs. He included the company in a circling turn of the head. Anyone who cares to go... Bobby forced himself to walk up the staircase, facing the first phase of his ordeal. He saw that the district attorney realized that, too, for he sprang from his chair and, followed by Rollins, started upward. The entire company crowded the stairs. At the top, Bobby found Paradis at his side. "'Carlos, why do you come?' "'I would like to be of some comfort,' Paradis answered gravely. His fingers on the banister made that restless groping motion. Graham summoned Catherine. One of the black-clothed men opened the door of Silas Blackburn's room. He stepped aside, beckoning. He had an air of a showman, craving approbation for the surprise he had arranged. Bobby went in with the others. Automatically, through the dim light, he catalogued remembered objects, all intimate to his grandfather, each oddly entangled in his mind with his dislike of the old man. The iron bed, the chest of drawers, scratched and with broken handles, the closed colonial desk, the miserly rag carpet, all seemed mutely asking, as Bobby did, why their owner had deserted them the other night and delivered himself to the ghostly mystery of the old bedroom. Reluctantly, Bobby's glance went to the center of the floor where the casket rested on trestles. From the chest of drawers two candles, the only light, played wanly over the still figure in the ashen face. So for the second time the living met the dead, and the law watched hopefully. Robinson stood opposite, but he didn't look at Silas Blackburn, who could no longer accuse. He stared instead at Bobby, and Bobby kept repeating to himself, I didn't do this thing. I didn't do this thing. End of Chapter 7, Section 1 Recording by Alex Bowie, Woodbridge, Virginia Part 2 of Chapter 7 of The Abandoned Room this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The Abandoned Room by Wadsworth Camp. Chapter 7. The Amazing Meeting in the Shadows of the Old Courtyard and he searched the face of the dead man for a confirmation a chill thought not without excuse under the circumstances and in this vague light raced along his nerves silas blackburn had moved once since his death if the power to move and speak should miraculously return to him now in this house there appeared to be no impossibilities the cold control of death had been twice broken. Catherine's entrance swung his thoughts and released him for a moment from Robinson's watchfulness. He found he could turn from the wrinkled face that had fascinated him, that had seemed to question him with a calm and complete knowledge, to the lovely one that was active with a little smile of encouragement. He was grateful for that, it taught him that in the heavy presence of death and from the harsh trappings of mourning, the magnetism of youth is unconquerable. So in affection he found an antidote for fear. Even Graham's quick movement to her side couldn't make her presence less helpful to Bobby. He looked at his grandfather again. He glanced at Robinson. As in a dream he heard the clergyman say, the service will be read at the grave. Almost indifferently he saw the dark-clothed men sidle forward, lift a grotesquely shaped plate of metal from the floor, and fit it in place, hiding from his eyes the closed eyes of the dead man. 
he nodded and stepped to the hall where robinson tapped his arm and whispered make way mr blackburn he watched the somber men carry their heavy burden across the hall down the stairs and into the dull autumn air he followed at the side of Catherine along the clearing and into the overgrown path. He was aware of the others drifting behind. Catherine slipped her hand in his. It is dreadful we shouldn't feel more sorrow, more regret, she said. Perhaps we never understood him. That is dreadful, too, for no one understood him. We are the only mourners. Bobby, as they threaded the path behind the stumbling bearers, found a grim justice in that also. Because of his selfishness, Silas Blackburn had lived alone. Because of it, he must go to his long rest with no other mourners than these, and their eyes were dry. Bobby clung to Catherine's hand. If I could only know, he whispered. She pressed his hand. She did not reply. Ahead the forest was scarred by a yellow wound. The bearers set their burden down beside it, glancing at each other with relief. Across the heap of earth Bobby saw the waiting excavation. In his ears vibrated the memory of the harsh voice. It's deep enough. Another voice droned. It was soft and unctuous. It seemed to take a pleasure in the terrible words it loosed to stray eternally through the decaying forest. Bobby glanced at bent stones strangled by the underbrush, at other slabs cracked and brown which lay prone half covered by creeping vines. The tones of the clergyman were no longer revolting in his ears. He scarcely heard them. He imagined a fantasy. He pictured the inhabitants of these forgotten narrow houses straying to the great dwelling where they had lived, punishing this one, bringing him to suffer with them the degradation of their neglect. So Robinson became less important in his mind. Through such fancies, the ordeal was made bearable. A wind sprang up, rattling through the trees and disturbing the vines on the fallen stones. Later, he thought, it would snow, and he shivered for those left helpless to sleep in the sad forest. The dark-clothed men strained at ropes now. They glanced at Catherine and Bobby as at those most to be impressed by their skill. They lowered Silas Blackburn's grimly shaped casing into the sorrel pit. It passed from Bobby's sight, too roughly, dressed laborers came from the thicket where they had hidden and with their spades approached the grave the sound from whose eminence bobby had shrunk rattled in his ears the yellow earth cut across the stormy twilight of the cemetery and scattered in the trench after a time the response lost its metallic petulance catherine pulled at bobby's hand he started and glanced up one of the black-clothed men was speaking to him with a professional gentleness. You needn't wait, Mr. Blackburn. Everything is finished. He saw now that Robinson stood across the grave still staring at him. The professional mourner smiled sympathetically and moved away. Catherine, Robinson, the two grave-diggers, and Bobby alone were left of the little company and Bobby, staring back at the district attorney, took a somber pride in facing it out until even the men with the spades had gone. The ordeal, he reflected, had lost its poignancy. His mind was intent on the empty trappings he had witnessed. He wondered if there was, after all, no justice against his grandfather in this unkempt burial. The place might have something to tell him, if it could only make him believe that beyond the inevitable fact nothing mattered. If he were sure of that, it would offer a way out of the worst, perhaps the happiest exit for Catherine's sake. Then Dr. Groom returned. His huge, hairy figure dominated the cemetery. His infused eyes beneath the thick black brows were far-seeing. They seemed to penetrate Bobby's thought. Then they glanced at the excavation, appearing to intimate 
that silas blackburn's earthy blanket could hide nothing from the closed eyes it sheltered at his age he faced the near approach of that inevitable fact and he didn't hesitate to look beyond bobby knew what graham had meant when he had said that groom had brought the ghost back with him it was as if the cemetery had recalled the old doctor to answer his presumptuous question there's no use your staying here the resonance of the deep voice jarred through the woods the broad shoulders twitched one of the hairy hands made a half circle i hope you'll clean this up my boy you ought to replace the stones and trim the graves you couldn't blame them could you if these old people were restless and tried to go abroad for bobby in spite of himself the man on whose last shelter the earth continued to fall became once more a potent thing able to appraise the penalty of his own carelessness come katherine whispered but bobby lingered oddly fascinated supporting the ordeal to its final moment the blows of the backs of the spades on the completed mound beat into his brain the end the workmen wandered off through the woods from a distance the harsh voice of one of them came back i don't want to dig again in such a place people don't seem dead there robinson tried to laugh that man's wise he said to the doctor if Peretti spoke of this cemetery as being full of ghosts, I could understand him. The doctor's deep bass answered thoughtfully, Peretti is, is probably right. The man has a special sense, but I have felt it myself. The cedars and the forests are full of things that seem to whisper, things that one never sees. Such things might have an excuse for evil. Let's get out of here, Robinson said gruffly katherine withdrew her hand bobby reached for it again but she seemed not to notice she walked ahead of him along the path her shoulders a trifle bent bobby caught up with her katherine he said don't talk to me bobby he looked closer he saw that she was crying at last tears stained her cheeks her lips were strange to him in the distortion of a grief that seeks to control itself he slackened his pace and let her walk ahead. He followed with a sort of awe that there should have been grief for Silas Blackburn after all. He blamed himself because his own eyes were not moist. Back of him he heard the murmuring conversation of the doctor and the district attorney. Strangely it made him sorry that Robinson should have been more impressed than Howells by the doctor's beliefs. They stepped into the clearing. The wind had dissipated the smoke shroud. It was no longer low over the roofs. Against the forest and the darker clouds, the house had a stark appearance. It was like a frame from which the flesh had fallen. The black wagon had gone. The cedars was left alone to the solution of its mystery. Paredes, Graham, and Rollins waited for them in the hall. There was nothing to say. Paredes placed with a delicate accuracy fresh logs upon the fire. He arose, flecking the wood dust from his hands. How cold it will be here, he mused. How impossible of entrance when the house is left as empty as the woods to those who only go unseen. Bobby saw Catherine's shoulders shake. She had dried her eyes, but in her face was expressed an aversion for solitude a desire for any company, even that of the man she disliked and feared. Robinson took Rollins to the library for another futile consultation, Bobby guessed. Catherine sat on the arm of the chair, thrusting one foot toward the fresh blaze. It will snow, she said. It is very early for that. No one answered. The strain tightened. The flames leaped throwing in evanescent pulsations of brilliancy about the dusky hall. They welcomed Jenkins's announcement that luncheon was ready, but they scarcely disturbed the hurriedly prepared dishes, and afterward they gathered again in the hall, silent and depressed, appalled by the long, 
dreary afternoon which however possessed a single virtue of dividing them from another night for long periods the district attorney and the detective were closeted in the library now and then they passed upstairs and they could be heard moving about but no one save graham seemed to care already the officers had had every opportunity to search the house the old room no longer held an inhabitant to set its fatal machinery in motion yet bobby realized in a dull way that any moment the two men might come down to him saying we have found something you are guilty the heavy atmosphere of the house crushed such forecasts made them seem a little trivial bobby fancied it gathering density to cradle new mysteries the long minutes loitered dr groom made a movement to go why should i stay he grumbled what is there to keep me yet he sat back in his chair again and appeared to have forgotten his intention graham wandered off bobby thought he had joined rawlins and robinson in the library the only daylight entered the hall through the narrow slits of windows on either side of the front door bobby watching these was even with the problems night brought to him now glad when they grew paler paredes who had been smoking cigarette after cigarette arose and brought his card table drawing it close to him he arranged the cards in neat piles the uncertain firelight made it barely possible to identify their numbers dr groom gestured his disgust katherine stooped forward placing her hands on the table is it kind she asked so soon after he has left his house paredes started wait he said softly puzzled she glanced at him stay just as you are he directed there has been so much death in this house who knows languidly he placed his fingers on the edge of the table opposite hers what are you doing dr groom asked hoarsely wait paredes said again then bobby scarcely aware of what was going on saw the cards glide softly across the face of the table and flutter to the floor the table had lifted slowly toward the panamanian it stood now on two legs what is it katherine said it's moving i can feel it move beneath my fingers her words recalled to bobby unavoidably his experience in the old room don't do that the doctor cried paredes smiled if he answered the source of these crimes is as you think spiritual why not ask the spirits for a solution you see how quickly the table responds it is as i thought there is something in this hall haven't you a feeling that the dead are in this dark hall with us they may wish to speak see the table settled softly down without any noise it commenced to rise again katherine lifted her hands with a visible effort as if the table had tried to hold them against her will she covered her face and sat trembling i won't i Freddy shrugged his shoulders, appealing to the doctor. The huge, shaggy head shook determinedly. I'm not so sure I don't agree with you. I'm not so sure the dead aren't in this hall. That is why I have nothing to do with such dangerous play. It has shown us, at least, that you are a psychic, Mr. Paredes. I have a gift, Paredes murmured. It would be useful to speak with them they see so much more than we do he lifted his hands he waved them dejectedly he stooped and commenced picking up the cards the doctor arose i shall go now he sighed i don't know why i have stayed bobby got his coat and hat i'll walk to the stable with you he was glad to escape from the dismal hall in which the firelight grew more eccentric the court was colder and damper, and even beyond the chill was more penetrating than it had been at the grave that noon. Uneven flakes of snow sifted from the swollen sky, heralds of the white invasion. 
no more sleepwalking the doctor asked when he had taken the blanket from his horse and climbed into the buggy bobby leaned against the wall of the stable and told how graham had brought him back the previous night from the stairhead to which he had gone with a purpose he didn't dare sound the doctor shook his head you shouldn't tell me that you shouldn't tell anyone you place yourself too much in my hands as you are already in graham's hands maybe that is all right but the district attorney you're sure he knows nothing of this habit which seems to have commenced the night of the first murder no and i think paredes alone of those who know about that first night would be likely to tell him see that he doesn't the doctor said shortly i've been watching robinson if he doesn't make an arrest pretty soon with something back of it he'll lose his mind he mightn't stop to ask as i do as howells did about the locked doors and the nature of the wounds how shall i find the courage to sleep tonight bobby asked the doctor thought for a moment suppose i come back he said i've only one or two unimportant cases to look after i ought to return before dinner i'll take graham's place for tonight it's time your reactions were better diagnosed i'll share your room and you can go to sleep assured that you'll come to no harm that harm will come to no one through you i'll bring some books on the subject i'll read them while you sleep perhaps i can learn the impulse that makes your body active while your mind's a blank the idea of the influence of paredes which graham had put into words slipped back to bobby he was nevertheless strengthened by the doctor's promise to an extent the dread of the night fell from him like a smothering garment this old man who had always filled him with discomfort had become a capable support in his difficult hour he saw him drive away he studied his watch computing the time that must elapse before he could return he wanted him at the cedars even though the doctor believed more thoroughly than any one else in the spiritual survival of old passions and the power of the dead to project a physical evil he didn't care to go back to the hall it would do him good to walk to force as far as he could from his mind the memory of the ordeal at the grave the grim impending atmosphere of the house and suppose he should accomplish something useful suppose he should succeed where graham had failed so he walked toward the stagnant lake the flakes of snow fell thicker already they had gathered in white patches on the floor of the forest if this weather continued the woods would cease to be habitable for that dark feminine figure through which they had accounted for the mournful crying after howells's death which graham had tried to identify with the dancer maria as he passed the neighborhood of the cemetery he walked faster many yards of underbrush separated him from the little time-devastated city of the dead but its mere proximity forced on him as the old room had done a feeling of stealthy and intangible companionship he stepped from the fringe of trees about the open space in the centre of which the lake brooded the water received with a destructive indifference the fluttering caresses of the snowflakes bobby paused with a quick expectancy he saw nothing of the woman who had startled him that first evening but he heard from the thicket a sound like muffled sobbing and he responded again to the sense of a malevolent regard he hid himself among the trees and in their shelter skirted the lake the sobbing had faded into nothing for a long time he heard only the whispers of the snow and the grief of the wind when he had rounded the lake and was some distance beyond it however the moaning reached him again and through the fast deepening twilight he saw as di indistinctly as he had before a black feminine figure flitting among the trees in the direction of the lake graham's theory lost its value 
It was impossible to fancy the brilliant, colorful dancer in this black, shadowy thing. He commenced to run in pursuit, calling out, Stop! Who are you? Why do you cry through the woods? But the dusk was too thick, the forest too eager. The black figure disappeared. In retrospect, it was again as unsubstantial as a phantom. The flakes whispered mockingly. The wind was ironical. He found his pursuit had led him back to the end of the lake, nearest the cedars. He paused. His triumph was not unmixed with fear. A black figure stood in the open, quite close to him, gazing over the stagnant water that was like a veil for sinister things. He knew now that the woman was flesh and blood, for she did not glide away, and the snow made pallid scars on her black cloak. He crept carefully forward until he was close behind the black figure. Now, he said, you'll tell me who you are and why you cry about the cedars. The woman swung around with a cry. He stepped back abashed, not knowing what to say for there was still enough light to disclose to him the troubled face of Catherine, and there were tears in her eyes as if she might recently have expressed an audible grief. You frightened me, Bobby. Without calculation he spoke his swift thought. Was it you I saw here before? But surely you didn't cry in the house the other night and afterwards when we followed Carlos. The tranquil beauty of her face was disturbed. When she answered, her voice had lost something of its music. What do you mean? It was you who cried just now. It was you I saw running through the woods. What do you mean? She asked again. I have not run. I, I am not your woman in black, if that's what you think. I happen to pick up this cloak. You've seen it often enough before, and I haven't cried. She brushed the tears angrily from her eyes. At least I haven't cried so anyone could hear me. I wanted to walk. I hoped I would find you. I thought you had come this way, so I came too. Why, Bobby, you're suspecting me of something. But the problem of the fugitive figure receded before the more intimate one of his heart. There was a thrill in her desire to find him in the solitude of the forest. Only the faintest gray survived in the sky above the trees. The shadows were thick about them. The whispering snow urged him to use this moment for his happiness. It wasn't the thought of Graham that held him back. Last night, under an equal temptation, he might have spoken. Tonight a new element silenced him and bound his eager hands. His awakening at the head of the stairs raised an obstacle to self-revelation around which there seemed to exist no path. I'm sorry, let us go back, he said. She looked at him inquiringly. What is it, Bobby? You are more afraid today than you have ever been before. Has something happened I know nothing of? He shook his head. He couldn't increase her own troubles by telling her of that. The woods seemed to receive an ashy illumination from the passage of the snowflakes. Catherine walked a little faster. Don't be discouraged, Bobby, she begged him. Everything will come out straight. You must keep telling yourself that. You must fight until you believe it. The nearness of her dust-clothed slender figure filled him with a new courage, obscured to an extent his real situation. He burst out impulsively. Don't worry, I'll fight. I'll make myself believe. If necessary, I'll tell everything I know in order to find the guilty person. She placed her hand on his arm. Her voice fell to a whisper. Don't fight that way. Uncle Silas is dead. Howells has been taken away. The police will find nothing. By and by they will leave. It will all be forgotten. Why should you keep it active and dangerous by trying to find who is guilty? Catherine, he cried, surprised. Why do you say that? Her hand left his arm. She walked on without answering. Paredes came back to him. Paredes serenely calling attention 
to the fact that Catherine had alarmed the household and had led it to the discovery of the Cedars' successive mysteries. He shrank from asking her any more. They left the thicket. In the open space about the house, the snow had spread a white mantle. From it, the heavy walls rose black and forbidding. I don't want to go in, Catherine said. Their feet lagged as they followed the driveway to the entrance of the court. The curtains of the room of death, they saw, had been raised. A dim, unhealthy light slipped from the small paned windows across the court, staining the snow. Robinson and Rawlins were probably searching again. Suddenly Catherine stopped. She pointed. What's that? she asked sharply. Bobby followed the direction of her glance. He saw a black patch against the wall of the wing opposite the lighted windows. It's a shadow, he said. She relaxed, and they walked on. They entered the court. There she turned, and Bobby stopped, too, with a sudden fear. For the thing he had called a shadow was moving. He stared at it with a hypnotic belief that the cedars was at last disclosing its supernatural secret. He knew it could be no illusion since Catherine swayed, half fainting, against him. The moving shadow assumed the shape of a stout figure slightly bent at the shoulders. A pipe protruded from the bearded mouth. One hand waved a careless welcome. Bobby's first instinct was to cry out, to command this old man that they had seen buried that day, to return to his grave, for there wasn't the slightest doubt. The unhealthy candlelight from the room of death shone full on the gray and wrinkled face of Silas Blackburn. End of chapter 7, section 2《of Chapter 8 of the Abandoned Room》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The Abandoned Room by Wadsworth Camp. Chapter 8, Section 1 What Happened at the Grave Hello, Katie. Hello, Bobby. You've shown your face at last. I hope you've come sober. The thin, quarrelsome voice of Silas Blackburn echoed in the moldy court. The stout, bent figure in the candlelight studied them suspiciously. Catherine clung to Bobby trembling startled beyond speech by the apparition they both stared at the gray face at the thick figure which three days after death they had seen buried that noon in the overgrown cemetery bobby recalled how dr groom had reminded him that an activity like this might emerge from such places he had suggested that the condition of the family burial ground might be an inspiration to such strains. Yet why should the spirit of Silas Blackburn have escaped? Why should it have returned forthwith to the Cedars, unless to face his grandson as his murderer? Afterwards, Bobby experienced no shame for these reflections. The encounter was a fitting sequel to the moment in the dark room when he had felt Howells move beneath his hand. He had a fleeting faith that the void between the living and the dead had indeed been bridged. Then he wondered that the familiar figure failed to disintegrate, and he noticed smoke curling from the blackened briar pipe. He caught its pungent aroma in the damp air of the court. Moreover, Silas Blackburn had spoken, challenging him as usual with a sneer. Let us go past, Catherine whispered. But Silas Blackburn stepped out, blocking their way. He spoke again. His whining accents held a reproach. What's the matter with you two? 
You might have seen a ghost. Or maybe you're sorry to have me back. Didn't you wonder where I was, Katie? Reckon you hoped I was dead, Bobby. Bobby answered. He had a fancy of addressing emptiness. Why have you come? That is what you are to us, dead. Silas Blackburn chuckled. He took the pipe from his mouth and tapped the tobacco down with a knotted forefinger. I'll show you how dead I am. Trying to be funny, ain't you? I'll make you laugh on the wrong side of your face. It's cold here. I'm going in. The same voice, the same manner. Yet his presence denied that great fact which during three days had been impressed upon them with a growing fear. The old man jerked his thumb toward the dimly lighted windows of the wing. What you got the old room lighted up for? What's going on there? I tried to sleep there the other night. Uncle! Catherine sprang forward. She stretched out her hand to him with a reluctance as pronounced as Graham's when he had touched Howell's body. Her fingers brushed his hand. Her shoulders drooped. She clung to his arm. To Bobby this resolution was more of a shock, less to be explained than his first assurance of an immaterial visitor. What did it mean to him? Was it an impossible assurance of safety? The old man patted Catherine's shoulder. Why, what are you crying for, Katie? Always seems something to scare you lately. He jerked his thumb again toward the lighted windows. You ain't told me yet what's going on in the old room. Bobby's laugh was dazed, questioning. They're trying to account for your murder there. His grandfather looked at him with blank amazement. You out of your head? No, Catherine cried. We saw you lying there, cold and still. I, I found you. You've not forgotten, Catherine, Bobby said breathlessly. That he moved afterward. Silas Blackburn took his hand from Catherine's shoulder. Trying to scare me? What's the matter with you? Some scheme to get my money? You slept in the old room the other night, Bobby asked helplessly. No, I didn't sleep there, his grandfather whined. I went in and laid down, but I didn't sleep. I defy anybody to sleep in that room. What are you talking about? It's cold here. This court was always damp. I want to go in. Is there a fire in the hall? We'll light one while you tell me what's ailing you. He turned and grasped the doorknob. They followed him into the hall, shaking the snow from their coats. Peretti sat alone by the fire, languidly engaged in the solitaire which exerted so potent a fascination for him. He didn't turn at their entrance. It wasn't until Bobby called out that he moved. Carlos! Bobby's tone must have suggested the abnormal, for Peretti sprang to his feet, knocking over the table. The cards fell lightly to the floor, straying as far as the hearth. His hands caught at the back of his chair. He remained in an awkward position, rigid, white-faced, staring at the newcomer. I told you all, he whispered, that the court was full of ghosts. Silas Blackburn walked to the fire and stood with his back to the smoldering logs. In this light he had the pallor of death, the lack of color Bobby remembered beneath the glass of the coffin. The old man, always so intolerant and authoritative, was no longer sure of himself. Why do you talk about ghosts? he whined. I, I wish I hadn't waked up. Peretti sat back in his chair. Waked up, he echoed in an awestruck voice. Bobby took a trivial interest, as one will turn to small things during the most vital moments, in the reflection that twice within twenty-four hours the Panamanian had been startled from his cold reserve. Waked up, Paredes repeated. His voice rose. At what time do you remember the time? Not exactly. Sometime afternoon. 
Bobby guessed the object of Paredes's question. He knew it had been about noon when they had seen the coffin covered in the restless, windswept cemetery. Paredes hurried on. How long have you been asleep? What makes you ask that? The other whined. I don't know. It was a long time. Blackburn's voice rose complainingly. How did you guess that? I never slept so. I dozed nearly three days, but I'm tired now. Tired as if I hadn't slept at all. Paredes made a gesture of surrender. Bobby struggled against the purpose of the man's questions, against the suggestion of his grandfather's unexpected answers. Your idea is madness, Carlos, he whispered. This house is filled with it, Paredes said. I wish Groom were here. Groom ought to be here. He's coming back, Bobby told him. He shouldn't be long now. He said before dinner time. Paredes stirred. I wish he would hurry. The Panamanian said nothing more, as if he realized the futility of pressing the matter before Dr. Groom should return. Necessary questions surged in Bobby's brain. The two that Paredes had put, however, disturbed his logic. Catherine, who hadn't spoken since entering, kept her eyes fixed on her uncle. Her lips were slightly parted. She had the appearance of one afraid to break a silence, covering impossible doubts. Bobby called on his reason. His grandfather stood before him in flesh, with the old man... In spite of Paredes's ghastly hint, probably lay the solution of the entire mystery and his own safety. He was about to speak when he heard footsteps in the upper hall. His grandfather glanced inquiringly through the stairwell, asking, Who's that up there? The sharp tone confessed that fear of the cedars was active in the warped brain. The district attorney, Bobby answered, a detective, probably Hartley Graham. What are they doing here? He indicated Paredes. What's this fellow doing here? I never liked him. Catherine answered. They've all come because I thought I saw you dead, lying in the old room. We all saw, Bobby cried angrily, and Paredes nodded. Blackburn shrank away from them. The three men descended the stairs. Halfway down they stopped. Who is that? Robinson cried. Graham's face whitened. He braced himself against the banister. Next time, Mr. District Attorney, Beretti said, you'll believe me when I say the court is full of ghosts. He walked in from the court. I tell you, they found him in the court. Silas Blackburn's voice rose, shrill and angry. What's the matter with you all? Why do you talk of ghosts and my being dead? Haven't I a right to come into my own house? You all act as if you were afraid of me. Paredes' questions had clearly added to the uncertainty of his manner. Catherine spoke softly. We are afraid. The others came down. Robinson walked close to Silas Blackburn and for some time gazed at the gray face. Yes, he said, you are Silas Blackburn. You came to my office in Smithtown the other day and asked for a detective because you were afraid of something out here. There's no question, Graham cried. Of course it is, Mr. Blackburn. Yet it couldn't be. What are you all talking about? Why are the police in my house? Why do you act like fools and say I was dead? They gathered in a group at some distance from him. They unconsciously ignored this central figure, as if he were, in fact, a ghost. Bobby and Catherine told how they had found the old man, a black shadow against the wall of the wing. Paredes repeated the questions he had asked and their strange answers. Afterwards, Robinson turned to Silas Blackburn, who waited, trembling. Then you did go to the old room to sleep. You lay down on the bed, but you say you didn't stay. You must tell us why not, and how you got out, and where you've been during this prolonged sleep. 
I want everything that happened from the moment you entered the old bedroom until you wakened. That's simple, Silas Blackburn mouthed. I went there along about ten o'clock. Wasn't it, Katie? Nearly half past, she said, and you frightened me. You must tell us why he went, why he was afraid to sleep in his own room, Graham began. Robinson held up his hand. One question at a time, Mr. Graham. The important thing now is to learn what happened in the room. You're not forgetting Howells, are you? Silas Blackburn glanced at the floor. He moved his feet restlessly. He fumbled in his pocket for some loose tobacco. With shaking fingers, he refilled his pipe. Except for Bobby and Catherine, he quavered. You don't know what that room means to Blackburns, and they only know by hearsay, because I've seen it was kept closed. Don't see how I'm going to tell you. You needn't hesitate, Robinson encouraged him. We've all experienced something of the peculiarities of the Cedars. Your return alone is enough to keep us from laughter. All right, the old man stumbled on. I was raised on stories of that room. Even before my father shot himself there, later on I saw Catherine's father die in the big bed, and after that I never cared to go near the place unless I had to. The other night, when I made up my mind to sleep there, I tried to tell myself all this talk was Tommy rot. I tried to make myself believe I could sleep as comfortably in that bed as anywhere. So I went in and locked the door and raised the window and laid down. You're sure you locked the door? Robinson asked. Yes, I remember turning the key in both doors because I didn't want anything bothering me from the outside. They all looked at each other, unable to forecast anything of Blackburn's experience. For both doors had been locked when the body had been found. Granted life, how would it have been possible for Silas Blackburn to have left the room to commence his period of drowsiness? An explanation of that should also unveil the criminal's route in and out. The tensity of the little group increased, but no one interposed the obvious questions. Robinson was right. It would be quicker to let the protagonist of this unbelievable adventure recite its details in his own fashion. Paredes ran his slender fingers gropingly over the faces of several of the cards he had picked up. When I got in bed, Silas Blackburn continued, I thought I'd let the candle burn for company's sake. But there was a wind, and it came in the open window, and it made the queerest black shadows dance all over the walls until I couldn't stand it a minute longer. I blew the candle out and lay back in the dark. He drew harshly on his cold pipe. He looked at it with an air of surprise and slipped it in his pocket. It was the funniest darkness. I didn't like it. You put your hand out and close your fingers as if you could feel it. But it wasn't all black, either. Some moonlight came in with the wind between the curtains. It wasn't exactly yellow, and it wasn't white. After a little while, it seemed alive, and I wouldn't look at it any more. The only way I could stop myself was to shut my eyes, and that was worse, for it made me recollect my father the way I saw him lying there when I was a boy. God grant none of you will ever have to see anything like that. Then I seemed to see Katie's father, too, and I remember his screams. The room got thick with things like that, with those two and with a lot of others come out of the pictures and the stories I've heard about my family. His experience when he had gone to the room to take the evidence from Howell's body became active in Bobby's memory. There I lay with my eyes shut. Silas Blackburn went on in his strange, inquiring voice. And yet I seemed to see those dead people all around me, and I thought they were in pain again, and were mad at me because I didn't do anything. 
I guess maybe I must have been dozing a little, for I thought he broke off. He raised his hand slowly and pointed in the direction of the overgrown cemetery where they had seen his coffin covered that noon. His voice was lower and harsher when he continued. I, I thought I heard them say that things were all broken out there, and, and awful, so awful they couldn't stay. His voice became defiant. I ain't going to tell you what I dreamed. It was too horrible, but I made up my mind I would do what I could if I ever escaped from that room. I, I was afraid they'd take me back w with them underneath those broken stones. And you, you stand there trying to tell me that they did. He paused again, looking around with a more defiant glare in his bloodshot eyes. He appeared to be surprised not to find them laughing at him. "'What's the matter with you all?' he cried. "'Why ain't you making me out a fool? "'You've seen something in that room, too.' "'Go on,' Robinson urged. "'What happened then? "'What did you do?' "'Blackburn's voice resumed its throaty monotone. "'As he spoke, he glanced about slyly, "'suspecting, perhaps, the watchfulness of the fancies "'that had intimidated him. "'I realized I had to get out if they would let me.' So I left the bed. I went. He ceased, intimating that he had told everything. I know, Robinson said, but tell us how you got out of the room. For when you, when the murder was discovered, both doors were locked on the inside, and you know how impossible the windows are. I tell you, Catherine said hysterically, it was his body in the bed. Bobby knew her assurance was justified, but he motioned her to silence. Let him answer, Robinson said. Silas Blackburn ran his knotted fingers through his hair. He shook his head doubtfully. That's what I don't understand myself. That's what's been worrying me while these young ones have been talking as if I was dead and buried. I recollect telling myself I must go. I seem to remember leaving the bed all right, but I don't seem to remember walking on the floor or going through the door. You're sure the doors were locked? No doubt about that, Rawlins said. Seems to me, Blackburn went on, that I was in the private staircase. But did I walk downstairs? First thing I see clearly is the road through the woods not far from the station. What did you wear? Robinson asked. I had my trousers and jacket on under my dressing gown, the old man answered, because I knew the bed wasn't made up. That's what I wore except for the dressing gown. I reckon I must have left that in the room. I wouldn't have gone back there for anything. My mind was full of those angry people. I wanted to get as far away from the Cedars as possible. I knew the last train from New York would be along about three o'clock, so I thought I'd go on into Smithtown and in the morning see this detective I've been talking to. I went to Robert Waters' house. I've known him for a long time. I guess you know who he is. He's such a bookworm I figured he might be up and he wouldn't ask a lot of silly questions being selfish like most people that live all the time with books. He came to the door, and I told him I wanted to spend the night. He offered to shake hands. That's funny, too. I didn't feel like shaking hands with anybody. I recollect that, because I felt sort of queer ever since going in the old room, and something told me I'd better not shake hands. Paredes looked up, wide-eyed. The card slipped from his fragile, pointed fingers. Do you realize, Mr. District Attorney, what this man is saying? But Robinson motioned him to silence. Let him go on. That's all, Blackburn answered, except this long sleep I can't make out. Old Waters didn't get mad at my not shaking hands. He was too tied up in some book, I guess. I told him I was sleepy and didn't want to be bothered, and he nodded to the spare room off the main hall, and I tumbled into bed and was off almost before I knew it. 
Paredes sprang to his feet and commenced to walk about the hall. Tell us, he said, when you first woke up. I guess it was late the next afternoon, Silas Blackburn quavered, fumbling with his pipe again. But it was only for a minute. Paredes stopped in front of Robinson. When he turned, you see? It was Waters knocking on the door, Blackburn went on. I guess he wanted to know what was the matter, and he talked about some food. But I didn't want to be bothered, so I called to him through the door to go away, and turned over and went to sleep again. He turned over and went to sleep again, Catherine said, breathlessly, and it was about that time that I heard the turning in the old bedroom. Catherine, Graham called. What are you talking about? What are you thinking about? What else is there? She asked. She's thinking about the truth, Peretti said tensely. I've always heard of such things. So have you. You've read of them, if you read at all. India is full of it. It goes back to ancient Egypt. The same person simultaneously in two places. The astral body, whatever you choose to call it. It's the projection of one's self, whether consciously or unconsciously, perhaps the projection of something that retains reason after an apparent death. You heard him. He didn't seem to walk. He doesn't remember leaving the room, which was locked on the inside. His descent of the stairs was without motion as we know it. He had gone some distance before his mind consciously directed the movements of this active image of Silas Blackburn, while the double from which it had sprung lay apparently dead in the old room. You notice he shrank from shaking hands, and he slept until we hid away the shell. What disintegration and coming together again has taken place since we buried that shell in the old graveyard? If his friend had shaken hands with him, would he have grasped emptiness? Did his normal self come back to him when the shell was put from our sight and he awakened? These are some of the questions we must answer. You've a fine imagination, Mr. Paredes, Robinson said dryly. His fat face, nevertheless, was bewildered, and in the eyes, surrounded by puffy flesh, smoldered a a profound uncertainty. I wish Groom were here, Paredes was saying. He would agree with me. He would know more about it than I. End of chapter 8 Section 1 Of The Abandoned Room